Their first live performance was on the 3rd of September 1987, and they had yet to add Picciotto to the lineup. Yet, he still appears on the show's flyer as a waiter. By the second show, Picciotto was acting as hype man for Fugazi, as a kind of punk rock version of Public Enemy's Flavor Fave. His softer, more emotive croon bouncing off the more drill sergeant bellow of Mackay. <laughs> Mackay stated in Our Band Could Be Your Life that initially he had wanted to start a band that was, like the Stooges, with reggae. His chunky low-end riffs inspired in part by Stooges Ron Ashton. Lally's bassline were high-ended Joy Division inspired things with the occasional dub interlude. I broke the surface so I can breathe, I close my eyes so I When Picciotto joined on guitar, he would play off Mackay, him taking the scratchy funk-inspired high ground, like a noise rock version of James Brown guitarist Jimmy Nolan. <laughs> Bands like The Clash, Ruts, and even Queen have been connected to the sound Fugazi were trying to achieve. All in all, Fugazi were a huge evolutionary leap from early 80s hardcore, and from their first self-titled EP onwards, they had the punk scene's full attention. The most immediately striking element of Waiting Room is the abrupt halt at the 22 second mark. In a lot of pop music, a lyric featuring the word stop will be followed by a slight pause or According to Fugazi historian Joe Gross, the lyric was supposedly written about Mackay's growing impatience with being on the sidelines as DC Punk started another growth spurt. The pause is symbolic of his desire to start things, but having to stop, he has to remain a patient boy. Waiting Room was the first thing most people heard by Fugazi, not just because it was their nearest thing to a radio hit, but also because it's the first track on their first EP. The pause is empty, yet all too pregnant. But if you listen to the first demo version of the track, released to the public in 2014, you would hear it as a joke, a fuck up by the band that makes them sound shambolic, rather than masters of the start-stop rhythm. Hello. Oh. Sid Canty in 2016. We thought it was hilarious and we were going to leave it in the version and producer Ted Nicely was like, don't be fucking assholes, you guys. If you guys have any hope for airplay, we're like, airplay? Fuck you. He's like, any hope for airplay? You're going to take that shit out. Pitchfork and Alternative Press have noted that if the demo version of Waiting Room was the one that had opened their first release, Fugazi would have influenced no one. <laughs> Quote Gross again, the most important thing to understand when thinking about Fugazi's songwriting is the vast majority of the band's songs were not as much written as they were assembled. At the very start, most songs were written wholesale by Mackay, him presenting a new track and the rest of the band learning it. By 1989, the process had become more collaborative. Any song brought in would be workshopped, rewritten, embellished. By 1993's In On The Kill Taker, all band members were bringing in bits of song to be combined into full pieces. If you listen to any given recorded Fugazi practice, you will hear Frankenstein songs. Verses of one song combined with riffs of another. Said Mackay in a 2011 interview, That's how we operated. We just had a bag of parts and we'd find things that would fit together. We were an instrumental band. We really wrote instrumentals and Guy, Joe or I would say, well, I might be able to sing over this thing. Once the instrumental version of the song was finished, it could be played live years before it would reach the completed album version. While in the instrumental stage, these tracks would have working titles inspired by pop culture or whatever. For example, Link Ray and Runaway Train. The argument track, Epic Problem, was based on one such working title. Canty stated, We had song parts that were total song killers. Once we put them in, that song was utterly doomed. The riff for Epic Problem was like that. It 
It was around for years. Record after record, we could never make it work. Finally, we figured it out and figured it should keep the title. Another example was Great Cop, perhaps the most straight up hardcore song the band ever wrote. <laughs> It was written by Mackay in 1982, taking 11 years from inception to album track. The aspect of Fugazi that most fans in 2019 will probably never experience fully was their outstanding live show. There were many elements that made Fugazi stand out from others in a live setting. For one, the band never used set lists. While this could potentially have led to disjointed sets, awkward fumbling and the occasional off notes, this rarely happened. The band, often able to string five or six songs together without stopping, able to communicate efficiently on stage so that everyone knew what was next. This was no doubt helped by the band's ample rehearsal time, stated as between four and six hours a day, four days a week. This set listless approach made it so that each show was unique. Before starting, the band would only know which song they were starting with, which depending on the song would indicate how they are feeling. For example, instrumentals like Brendan One or Joe One seemed to indicate that everyone was in a good mood, that fan favourites might be heard. Opening with something like Break or Do You Like Me suggests a more confrontational show. Sets would alternate between songs sung by Mackay and songs by Picciotto, complicated slightly when Lolly started singing live. They were such a fine-tuned entity that they could pull out any one of their hundred or so songs at a moment's notice. Some were played more than others, Waiting Room is their most played track, while it got to the point where they forgot how to play Steady Diet of Nothing track, Polish. Compare this to Blink-182, who played pretty much the same show for two years. Despite their unpredictability, there were a few things that could be counted on. There would never be merch. The most famous Bugazi t-shirt design, a bootleg, calling attention to how it was not an official shirt. This anti-consumerist stance can be heard on their iconic merchandise. An entry would be no more than $5. Makai stated in 1991, there's a lot of reasons for that. One is that we don't particularly want to pay more than $5 to see a band. I always feel shitty when I have to lay out a lot of dough, because then I want that to entertain my ass. And that's the other side. For 5 bucks, we could suck. Because we're human, and we do suck sometimes. Being that Fugazi were a band that came from, but wanted to separate themselves from the DC hardcore scene, they took issue with moshing at their shows, believing it to be a boring expression of violence that made things worse for everyone at their show. Fugazi never had venue security at their show. Makai and Pikioto would police the crowd themselves, stopping the show if people were getting too rough. I've read things with people saying, oh, he just heckles the audience the whole time. They don't understand that it was a reaction to the environment. I think when people go to punk shows today, they don't have any idea what those shows were like. Instead of wading in and meeting violence with violence, they would frequently use kindness and humour to pacify the situation. For example, at their show at Fort Reno Park in Washington DC in 1993, a couple of skinhead guys starting trouble in the front rows of their show. Picciotto steps in to defuse. You know, I saw you two guys earlier at the Good Humour truck and you were eating your ice cream like little boys and I thought, those guys aren't so tough, they're eating ice cream, what a bunch of swell guys. I saw you eating ice cream, pal. Oh, don't you deny it, you were eating an ice cream cone. You were eating an ice cream cone. Oh, you're bad now, you're bad now, but you're eating an ice cream cone. And I saw you. That's the shit you can't hide, you know? You got your fucking shit, but you eat ice cream. Everybody knows it, the whole fucking place knows it. Ice cream eating motherfucker. That's what you are. <laughs> 